My sermon passage is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 to 8. But he himself, the prophet Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, else the journey will be too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. The word of the Lord. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> I don't know about y'all, but I'm about worn out. And that's after two weeks of vacation from news editing and writing and reporting and having a Saturday off a week ago, not spent working on a sermon. And I had last Sunday off. I had all that time, quote, off, but a vacation never took. Dolores and I did manage to take two little day trips, but it was mostly just time off. No real vacation. Thank you, Delta. Thank you, Delta variant of the blasted coronavirus. It really started to make the news about three days before my two weeks time went off and it derailed a couple of plans that we had. The dawning of Delta set us all back. It took what little wind was in my sails just as we were about to launch into uncharted waters for Trinity, a real live stream, an actual system rather than the smartphone, borrowed tripod, bubble gum, spit and bailing wire that have had us live online, however improbably, for nearly 18 months now. By the way, good morning to the Facebook congregation. Be sure and click or leave a comment. Click like or leave a comment so we know you're there. We are ready to go forward, and we will. But I got knocked low again, and I just decided to go down for a while. Some of these blows to my heart and mind and dreams are personal, and you know of them. Physical pain, lost big brother, distressing changes in my day job, lost big sister, Pandemic-related estrangement from Avery Noel, the grandest granddaughter in the world, and her mama and daddy down in Houston. It'll be two years at the time we see them. And you've all had your own personal blows to your own heart, mind, and dreams. And some of the blows to heart, mind, and dreams are universal to us all. Not being able to do some things we'd plan to do. Having to do some things we don't want to do. And watching in amazement as people ignore both science and sense and Christians ignoring both science and service to Christ and others. It is infuriating and exhausting. And if sometimes you just want to hang it up, give up, and let it all take you down, know that you're not alone. What I need and what you might need is a nap under a shade tree and a touch from the Lord, and something good to eat. And then another nap, another touch from the Lord, and some more nourishment from the Lord for our journey, lest this journey be too great for us. The prophet Elijah has lessons for us. And in the really startling, if you think about it. He was in trouble and in such despair that he was suicidal. At, uh, Elijah asked that he would die, it says. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. What was eating him? His own sin? It happens. Had Elijah slipped and fallen from the grace of God? No, he'd done nothing wrong. Elijah is a faithful servant of the living God, the Presbyterian minister, Susan Vandy Capel, declares. Now we know that faithful is one thing and faulty is another thing, and we know that 
all of us are both things, even Elijah. All the Bible heroes, except, of course, for our Lord, Savior, teacher, and hero, Jesus Christ. Elijah has known the Lord's provision in drought and famine. He speaks God's word to the weak and the powerful. On Mount Carmel, God answers Elijah's prayer for a resounding victory for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel over the false god Baal. Remember that? Let's review that contest. It's in the chapter before. I'm just going to hit the highlights. It's kind of a long story, but it's a classic Bible story, so I'll let the message tell it. The message Bible is a good storytelling Bible. 1 Kings 18, verses 20 to 39 so King Ahab summoned everyone in Israel, particularly the prophets, to Mount Carmel. Elijah challenged the people, How long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is the real God, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. Make up your minds. Nobody said a word. Nobody made a move. Then Elijah said, I'm the only prophet of God left in Israel, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. Let the Baal prophets bring up two oxen. Let them pick one, butcher it, and lay it out on an altar on firewood, but don't ignite it. I'll take the other ox, cut it up, and lay it on the wood, but neither will I light the fire. Then you pray to your gods, and I'll pray to God, and the God who answers with fire will prove to be, in fact, God. All the people agreed. That's a good plan. Do it. Elijah told the Baal prophets, choose your ox and prepare it. You go first. You're the majority. Then pray to your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the ox he'd given them, prepared it for the altar, and then prayed to Baal. They prayed all morning long, Oh, Baal, answer us. But nothing happened. Not so much as a whisper of breeze. Desperate, they jumped and stomped on the altar that they'd made. By noon, Elijah had started making fun of them, taunting Call a little louder. He is a god after all. Maybe he's off meditating somewhere. Or maybe he's gotten involved in a project. Or maybe he's on vacation. <laughs> you don't suppose he's overslept, do you? And he needs to be woken up? They prayed louder and louder, cutting themselves with swords and knives, a ritual common to them, until they were covered with blood. This went on until well past noon. They used every religious trick and strategy they knew to make something happen on the altar, but nothing happened. Not so much as a whisper, not a flicker of response. Then Elijah told the people, enough of that, it's my turn. Gather around. And they gathered. He then put the altar back together, for by now it was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Jacob, the same Jacob to whom God had said, from now on your name is Israel. He built the stones into the altar in honor of God. Then Elijah dug a fairly wide trench around the altar. He laid firewood on the altar, cut up the ox, put it on the wood, and said, Fill four buckets with water and drench both the ox and the firewood. Then he said, Do it again, and they did it. Then he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. The altar was drenched, and the trench was filled with water. When it was time for the sacrifice to be offered, Elijah the prophet came up and prayed, O oh God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make it known right now that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I'm doing what I'm doing under your orders. Answer me, God. O oh, answer me and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. Immediately the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and even the water in the trench. All the people saw it happen and fell on their faces in awed worship, exclaiming, God is the true God. God is the true God. Now that's a Bible hero. Mount Carmel was Elijah's home turf. Mount Carmel was also a sacred place for the Canaanites. So the setting was a culture clash and a religious clash, and a turf battle. A Baal was a local god. In this case, the Baal was the Canaanite agricultural god, the god who brought the rain. The big backdrop of the story is that there was a drought on. It hadn't rained for three years because Elijah, the prophet of the God of Israel, had declared that it would not rain. 
in direct defiance of evil King Ahab and his flirting with the Baal. It was more than flirting. Ahab was trying to be all things to all people and to all gods. And maybe he was trying to please his wife, Jezebel, who you might have heard of. She was the daughter of a neighboring king. And it was at her urging, Jezebel's, that King Ahab introduced the Israelites to Baal. Well, Elijah's God was bigger than the Baal God, and Elijah defeated the 450 priests of Baal in spectacular fashion. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. God won. Elijah called off the drought. And that is almost always where the story ends, in Sunday school classroom and in the pulpit. But the story goes on in the Bible. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed them there. It was a massacre right there in the Bible. It was awful. Whether or not it was ever considered a good thing to have 450 people killed in the name of God, we know now that it's not. This story is not an example to follow, but neither should we ignore it. We keep it, I think, as a cautionary tale. So I'm not so sure that Elijah's despair wasn't from a sin-sick soul. Or maybe faithful but faulty Elijah was just burned out. He does lament, I'm no better than my ancestors. Elijah sees no good in his life, Pastor Susan points out. Service to God has not brought him to a meaningful place in a congregation of the faithful. He assumes that he can be of no further service to the Lord. And what good is life without meaningful purpose? Or it could be that Elijah despairs because he's overwhelmed by the sheer extent of evil around him. Remember, it was Jezebel who got her husband, Ahab, to lead the people of Israel away from God and to Baal. And when Elijah defeated Baal's priests and massacred them, she was incensed. She swears revenge and promises to kill him, Elijah. Elijah then is now in a state of living death. Jezebel's power diminishes Elijah by isolating him from his people and turning him into a victim. Feeling the hopelessness of his situation, Elijah flees into the wilderness and seeks an end to his life. And what happened? Elijah, honest and transparent before God, was redeemed, rescued, saved from depression, saved from depression and given new life just as he was hitting bottom. He had lost hope. He had lost his direction in life. He had lost his sense of self and self-worth. And God acted with compassion, moving compassion. God gave him rest and nourished him. Pastor Susan sums up, Elijah's worth is not based on his performing great feats for God or dependent upon overcoming evil in his own strength. Elijah's worth is found in God's love for him and in the call of God upon his life. God's redemption leads to further prophetic service in Elijah's life. He was saved so he could keep going. By the way, I have to say, there is depression, there is despair, but if you're suicidal, get professional help. And pray as you go. All healing comes from God, I believe. But God usually works through human healers. Times are difficult for all of us in different ways, as well as in shared circumstances. I want to close with a very short litany and a short prayer for us all by the Reverend Donna Schaefer. She's a United Church of Christ pastor in New York City. It's another uh, couple of readings from Emerge. Blessings and Rituals for Unsheltering, a little book published by the UCC. Litany of Purpose. How to find purpose in times like these. 
especially since we don't know the name of the times or what the old name for the old times really was or what the new name for the new times will really be. What story will we tell about ourselves during the pandemic? I was fine. I survived. I coped. Or I called myself beloved and the earth called my name back to me. And now the prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, I don't know where I'm going today and tomorrow. I just know my lust and my desire for more of what I had yesterday. I also know that I am your child and beloved. I am not forgotten by you. Send me one sign today that I am still at all beloved, just one. And when I know I am beloved, let me get back on track, whatever track might be. Amen. It is our privilege to participate in the unfolding of God's grace in the world. Let us give with grateful and expectant hearts. The kingdom of heaven is near. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God is love. Thank God God is love. God loves all. Thank God. God loves all, and all means all. Go in peace, work for peace, pray for peace, wage peace, and love one another. Every single other. Every single other. Amen.